Reverend Jody spoke about the two parts uh, of the full apple of God, which was one, the, uh, the bell of truth, and then the breastplate of righteousness. And both are important in our journey as Christians who have been enrolled into the ministry. The thing is that most of us here don't think that we're enrolled into ministry, but God has commanded that all of us here to go and make disciples. From the moment we say yes to Jesus, the moment we say yes, I want to follow him, you are part of this family, but not just that, you're part of what we call a spiritual army. Yes, uh, I know those terms can be very sensitive nowadays to call someone an army, we call them a soldier, but that is what it is, the term that was used in scripture. And so when, when, when Paul used the analogy of putting on the full armor of the gospel, of Christ, of God, he wanted them to paint an image in their mind what a soldier looks like. And these are the pieces of the armor that they will use. So I want us to read again from Ephesians 6, verse 13 to 18. And together we shall read it, okay? So in 1, 2, 3. Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Today I want to focus on the third piece of the armor, which is the gospel of peace, the sandals of the gospel of peace. But before I go there, I want to stress the reason why we should have this armor first, to lay down the groundwork so that our mind will be able to gravitate towards the message, okay? The first thing's first, the purpose of the armor is not to fight a war, but to stand firm. We must understand that we don't need to fight this war. God has fought the war for us, and he's still fighting this battle in the spiritual realm. However, the fight that we do is in prayer. That's where you get it, pray at all times. Pray in all seasons. Pray that God will fight the battle for us. The thing is this, we come from a position of victory in Jesus Christ. We are not in a position of defeat, as if we have to fight for ground. Amen? The gospel tells us that Jesus has won the victory in himself on the cross. And so from the point of victory, in the point of the gospel, in a place of power, God, who is in us and with us by the Holy Spirit, is fighting the battle for us. Amen? So we must understand the position that we're in right now. We're in a victorious position. Have you ever played King of the Hill when you're young? Some of us have, right? So King of the Hill, the whole point is this. There's a little mound, a little hill, where you will run out and everybody will try to get onto the top of the hill. And so we'll push each other down and fight our way through. And eventually you'll stand at the top of the hill and say, it's King of the Hill. Right? But before you get there, you still need to fight the battle. But in a, in a sense of the Christian faith, you don't need that. Jesus did that for us. He is the king of kings. Amen? And that's important to recognize right here in our mind and our heart, that we fight in a position of power and authority in Jesus Christ. And so the battle that we fight is not against flesh and blood, the Bible says, but against principalities in the spiritual realm. There's a position that we're in, in a spiritual realm that is in Christ. If you read in Ephesians 1, all spiritual blessing has been given to you and I in Jesus Christ. Now, recognize in the first verse, it says, put on the full armor so that you can stand, right? But in verse 10, it says, be strong in the Lord. In who? In God. Not strong in yourself. When you fight a battle in a spiritual realm, it is not in your own strength. It is in his strength. The second thing is this, in his mighty power. You don't fight a battle in your power. This is the problem with a lot of Christians. Is this After we've come to Christ, we think we should go out there 
with our might and our strength as if we have the power. Even by claiming the name of Christ, but sometimes we do it in a very earthly sense, a worldly sense, not in submission to the power of God, but rather as if you have imposed the power of God in your life. We don't impose any power in ourselves, and we cannot impose it on anybody else. But rather we submit it to the authority of God and walk in submission by the power of the Spirit. And so when we talk about the mighty power that lives in us and through us, it is by the Spirit of God. If you can lay this groundwork down right now, the full armor of Christ that is given to us will have power to overcome principalities. Amen? Let me get back into it. So I want to focus on the feet fitted with the readiness. And the Greek translation says this a little bit different. It's having short of feet with readiness or preparedness for the gospel of peace. Short means to bind, to tie, to be covered. All right? And, and that's important to place that in your mind. Because when you think about the verse prior to this, it's fitted. It has a different connotation, a different expression to us. At the same time, it says, with the readiness, readiness that comes from. The, the much challenge for a lot of Christians is this. We're waiting for some sort of miracle to come from something into our lives. And say we need something more. But if you read the Greek, it says, of the gospel. There's a position that's different here. The gospel is ready and it's power on its own in Christ. We're not waiting for God to trickle down some authority into our lives. Already in the gospel, he has given us authority in Jesus Christ. And it's ready. Sometimes we're waiting to be ready. We're waiting, God, God, send me forth. Wait, uh, but I'm waiting for the gospel to grow in me. I'm waiting for the gospel to make sense to me. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for something from that position. But when you read this text, it says, shut your feet with readiness of the gospel. He is saying this. The gospel is for ready. Ready. It is right. It is powerful. And we need to stand in a position where the gospel is able to go take it out. We, we need to go in the power of what we know of the gospel. Now, let's talk about the gospel of peace, which is the center. The whole center is called the gospel of peace, alright? But before we can go further, let's talk about the peace of the other. Recognize that there are spikes embedded into the shoe or the sandals of the soldier. There are leather straps all the way up to the ankle to fasten it. Because if you have a low cut sandal, when you're marching, it will come off. I mean, logically understood, right? Try walking with your shoes that's low cut, all right, in the army field and someone steps behind your shoe and the whole shoe comes off. Or if you walk into the mud and your mud, your foot goes right into the mud, your foot will be this, uh, your, your, your shoes will come off, right? So it's, it makes sense to have the leather strap all the way to your ankle. And also there's insole, which is for your comfort, the midsole, and then the outer sole. And it is on this outer sole that this piece of leather right here with hobnails will be attached. So basically on a normal day, the soldier will take it off. He will not have spikes on his sandals. So he's walking like everybody else. But when he's called to arms, when he's called to fight the battle, when he's called to report, he will go and strap on this piece of leather with nails in there, hot nails, and, and attach it to his sandals. So now it becomes one piece of that sandal. Can you picture that now? So when he says, put on the sandals of the gospel, he is saying, in relation to this traction, these nails, these studs that a soldier will put on. If you can recognize it, then you can understand what I'm going to say next about the gospel. I want to stress the first point is about the gospel. The key component of the armor, one of the pieces of the armor, will be the gospel of peace. The sandals as the gospel of peace. You don't send a soldier out without his boots on. You can't walk around bare feet. That is dangerous. Right? You can't play sports without your shoes on. Unless your, your, your sports requires you to play without your shoes on. 
But most of the time, you wear your shoes. You have to have your shoes on. And it is part of the full armor. That means, right, you can't go out just with the shoes. You can't go out just with the gospel. Meaning you're going out and say, hey, I got the gospel. I got Jesus in my heart. But you don't have the shield to defend you when temptations come your way, when challenges come your way. You can't go into the into, into the battlefield just wearing a breastplate of righteousness and say, that's all. Today I want to practice righteousness. That's all I practice. But I'm not going to practice putting on my sandals of the gospel of peace. So we walk off just having righteousness as if that is enough. That is only part of the armor, but the whole armor requires the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoe of the gospel, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, and the helmet of salvation. And there's a, another one actually, which is not mentioned distinctly as an armor, but it's called prayer, the weapon of warfare. Amen? So, stressing on the gospel of peace. Why? Did Paul stress the gospel of peace and use that as a term rather than the gospel of Christ? I mean, he could have said, put on the gospel of Christ. Why did he not use the gospel of the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus proclaimed in the book of Matthew? He went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Why not the gospel of Christ, which Luke and Mark speaks about, this is the gospel of Christ. Why specifically the gospel of peace? We don't think much of this because we take, make assumptions that we know what is, he is saying. But when he's using this term, he's using it in the context of the people of Ephesus in the book of Ephesians. The people were under a lot of oppression. The Jewish people were saying to the Gentile believer that you're not yet truly belonging to the covenant. You need to be circumcised. You need to be Jewish. Then you can be fully a follower of Jesus Christ. We've heard a movement that's going around called going back to Judaism among Hebrew groups throughout the world. Going back to Judaism among Christianity. I want to tell you this. Be careful with that. Because that is causing discord and disunity within the church. Because Jesus didn't die just for the Jews, he died for the world. And he brought reconciliation between us and God. Amen? And of course, between Jew and Gentile. If you read that in the book of Ephesians, that's what he's saying. He's made them one humanity. But in the context of Ephesus, peace is required. And the peace that is required comes from God and not by anyone else. The devil's scheme in this context of the gospel of peace, that the, gospel, the, the, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. What, in this context, the unity of the church. He comes to disrupt the joy of being together in unity. All part of blessed is where brethren to us gather in unity, for there the Lord commands a blessing. And the devil knows that, and the devil wants to rob it from us. And so the stress, the gospel of peace, is important. Mm -hmm. To bring into the mind of the people of Ephesus, God brings shalom between you and him and you and one. Do not let the devil tell you other words. Do not be deceived to think that someone more spiritual, more holy, more righteous, only God is spiritual, only God is holy, God, only God is righteous. And the people he is appointed to teach the church to be holy and righteous. The apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, right? And all. These are the people that God has assigned to the church to raise them up into maturity so that they can warn against the enemy's scheme. So that they can teach us, look, that is the scheme of the enemy. So the first thing you must have to understand about the gospel of peace in context with Ephesus is the challenge to defend unity. To fight against the devil's scheme of breaking us apart. What today is causing disunity in the church? Think about that. We'll address that later on. Now, peace. What is the gospel? What does it imply? What does peace imply? In our mind, peace is a feeling. But to God, it is a condition. Peace is not a feeling. The Hebrew word is shalom. And shalom means that it is as it should be. Meaning, 
I like the Malay word more, sinporna. Meaning, it is as it is, no hindrances, no, uh, no alteration. It is as it was made to be, and it is still the way it should be. Shalom is God's plan for the world, peace. That he wants to restore all of mankind to bear the image of God in Christ again. That is shalom. Right now, the world is not in shalom because not many are in the image of God unless we have Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. We need to ask ourselves, are we in peace? God wants to restore all things as it should be. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul explained the gospel as Christ living, Christ dying, Christ coming again. He also explains that it is Christ overcoming sin and death, that is the gospel, and that in the gospel, Christ is reconciling humanity to the Father in himself. He brings us close to the Father in himself. And in Christ, he is restoring all creation. That is peace. Peace is not a feeling, but a condition that God wants to make for us. Now, what does it imply for us to do? The gospel of peace is the good news of Jesus Christ, reconciling mankind to God and to one another through his justifying and sanctifying work on the cross. God makes peace with us, first by justifying us. Last week, Reverend Johnny says justification and sanctification as two parts of righteousness. Let me stress this a bit more so that we can move with more confidence. Righteousness is two parts. One, to be righteous is to be justified. God says you are justified, thus you are righteous. You have been made right with God in a right relationship. But continuing from there after being justified is this. You are righteous. And being made righteous and continue to be made righteous because in the spirit, in the discipline of submission to the spirit, God is sanctifying us day by day to be formed into the image of Christ from glory to glory, from grace to grace. Amen. This is a powerful thought. The gospel of peace is the gospel of reconciliation. Now the question that I have for you, how are we as a Christian community representing and expressing this shalom to the world in your community? Christians should be the most shalom people. Should be. We should be in a position where we know that God is in control and in my life though there's turmoil all around, it is as it is with me, with God. I am in the right position with Him. I am not in a wave uh, in a boat that's pushed around and tossed around in a boat. But I am, while I am there, I am in constant peace. Constant shalom relationship. How many of us are representing to the world that beauty of shalom? Now, Christians should be the most joyful people. Are we the most joyful people? Hello? Sometimes we're the most, uh, most struggling people. Yes, we are struggling but struggling in the joy of the Lord as well. And the thing is this, people must be able to see us in that shalom and in the joy of that shalom so that they will turn to us and say, what is this gospel that you believe in? What is this good news? What is it that you have that I don't have but I want that? Is the gospel of peace right now transforming us as a community of peace? Or is there constantly struggling between us? Are there still people among us who are still in constant struggle with friction? The enemy is using this scheme to bring dissension and disunity. So first things first, put on the gospel of peace so that you can stand against the scheme of the enemy that robs us of peace. He wants us to doubt the gospel that tells us that we are one with Christ. I want to stress this part. And with your feet fitted with readiness. The gospel is ready. What I mean by this, the gospel gives life purpose. As Christians, without the gospel, who is Jesus Christ, dying, rising, 
and coming again. If we don't have the gospel, we cannot be Christians. Amen? Understand? Christianity exists simply because Jesus is. Simply because He exists to live for us as men, to die on the cross for our sins, and to rise again victorious so that we will know that we will have our own victory and resurrection. And in Him, He gives us new life by the Holy Spirit. The gospel gives us purpose to live on this Christian faith. Without the gospel, we don't know what we're doing. The gospel gives us purpose for mission and evangelism. To evangelize. Without the gospel, what are we evangelizing? What good news? What do we tell people about salvation? We don't have anything. But because of the gospel, we walk out of our homes confident that we are children of God, that they too can be children of God. The gospel of reconciliation is such good news that it is our driving force, our purpose, our motivation. We want to tell people, you know, everyone's talking about COVID-19 as the bad news, right? And everyone's talking about the vaccine as the good news. Today, a few people come up to me and say, hey, have you got your vaccine yet? As if it is the gospel. Have you heard the vaccine? You need the vaccine. Get the vaccine. Then you will be okay. Then you can travel to Malaysia. No. Don't travel there. Not yet. Then you can see the world. Not yet. The vaccine is not the gospel, but it feels like it today. And people are excited about the vaccine. Why? It is the closest thing to good news. But it is not the good news. But we are so ready to, make, um, to tell people about the good news of the vaccine. And so when someone got vaccinated, how many of you guys got vaccinated today? Already? Updated? Yeah? So everyone's going to ask you, right? So how does it feel? Right? Did they ask you, Dr. Kim? How does it feel to get vaccinated? They ask. They never ask me, how does it feel to have the gospel? They ask me, they will ask the person, how does it feel to get vaccinated? Oh, I just, a, a bit painful. <laughs> I had a little bit of fever. But after that, I was okay. Okay. I'm getting my jab number two in July. You know, you, you get people giving the testimony of the vaccination. What about Jesus Christ? What about the gospel? We're so excited about telling those things. What about, we, we tell the good news of the new shoe we buy or the Apple product that we got and all those things. What about the gospel that it is actually lies? And that's the challenge today. So if you have the good news, would you not tell? Will you not share? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says this, preach the word, basically proclaim it, declare the word, be prepared in and out of season. And of course, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to, keep, to give the reasons for the hope that you have. It is not saying when you feel convenience or when you feel like it or when you, you are ready it says always be ready in and out of season and always be prepared to give an answer. Always. Christians, right? We're all Christians here, right? Be prepared. It's not, this is the command. This is not, hey, uh, if you like it, uh, you, know, you can share the gospel when you like it. But it says be prepared. How many of us can say that we're prepared when we're not prepared? If someone comes up to you and says, you know what, brother? I see joy in your life. But I want to know this joy. I remember in 1998, a years ago, uh, on 97, we were traveling, and a friend of mine came up to me and said, Stephen, he was out in a mission trip. He wasn't a Christian. He was a non-Christian going on a mission trip with young Christians like this. We decided, hey, why not just bring one guy along who's not a Christian? Let's see what God's doing. So this young friend of mine who was not a uh, Christian came along, and he saw us evangelizing, praying, and, and, and reaching out, and he got excited. And he asked me this question after the mission trip. During the mission trip, I've challenged him many times, would you like to know Jesus? He says, no. No thanks. But after the mission trip, he said this one thing that was very distinct. He says, Stephen, I want what you all have. I said, what is it that we have? 
because we know the gospel, right? He said, I want what you all have. I said, what is it? It's joy. I want that joy. And that was enough for him to become a Christian. He sees the example of the Christian believers that was around him, who was expressing joy in declaring the gospel, expressing joy in being in the company of other believers, loving one another, building each other up. He says, I want a community of joy. Can I find that community? He says, well, of course. Would you want to know Jesus? And he came to Christ and makes all him get a leader in the church, a prominent one, bless him. You know? God is doing something miraculous. The thing is this, you ready in and out of season. Are you ready in and out of season? The gospel of peace requires us to be ready. Not when you feel like Paul was ready to go to prison for this gospel. It was enough for him to go all the way to prison. This is the reason we live as Christians. The gospel is our life for Jesus. Jesus Christ and Jesus coming again. And so, because of this gospel, we are ready to engage in a spiritual battle. Because of the gospel, it has given us this readiness. When the devil comes with its onslaught, with its temptations, with its challenges, we're ready. Why? Because we know that's what the gospel is. The gospel brings us to a position in the forefront of the enemy line. Because as long as we have the gospel and the faith to proclaim the gospel, the devil, Satan, will come and attack us and prevent us from spreading the good news. That's why you hear it in Paul. Pray for me also, so that I will be faithful to preach the gospel. That was in Ephesians chapter, um, after chapter verse 18, chapter 6. He told, tells us, pray also for him. The gospel is the source of purpose and purpose. The gospel. When you hear good news, you should jump out of your seat. You get excited. You should say, hallelujah, amen. When you hear the good news, you want to get out of this room and say, I heard the good news, and go to the street. Of course, in Brunei, we want to be careful, right? We want to be smart about it, but you want to do it. You want to think about this. You want to pray about this. You want to say, God, how can I share this wonderful news of Jesus Christ? Because we were all sinners, and we are in need of salvation, and Christ came to die for our sin while we were still enemies as God. How powerful that is while we were still enemies with God, condemned to die, and yet Christ became our substitute. The gospel is our source for purpose and witness. Without the gospel, there is no purpose. There's no way we can stand against death. No way we can understand why without the gospel, we're on shaky ground. Without the gospel, we don't have the spikes to keep us grounded. We are not able to withstand when the enemy comes because we don't know the truth, because the gospel is the truth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. How many of you know your gospel by heart? How many of you know that practice this gospel in your life? Are you ready for the gospel? Are you better ready to fight this war of Christ with the gospel? Let's talk about your feet. It's it. Strap on. When you wear your sandals or your shoes, you need to tie the laces. It is not safe to have untied shoes. Slip-ons are not enough for long-distance walking. It may be comfortable, but it can be dangerous. All right? The thing with shoes, at least in the context of Ephesians is that they are strapped on. It comes up to your ankle and it's meant to be fastened to you. The idea is this, you need to take time to get down on your knees. You need to strap it on. Take time to strap it on. With the gospel, you need to take time to put on the gospel into your life. Don't rush it. You don't put on the gospel and just walk out as if, yeah, it's all right. No, you take time. Revise again. Revisit the gospel. Think about the gospel. Think about Jesus Christ in the morning and be grateful for what he has done. And you take time 
and pray and step on. You know, it is a partnership between us and the gospel. There must be a commitment between us and the gospel. Just as the shoe must stay on our feet, and we're committed for that to stay on our feet if we're going to walk, it must stay on our feet. Then it's the same with the gospel. There must be a partnership between us and the gospel. That means there's a sense of intimacy with that gospel. And there's a requirement to trade. Now, let me talk about partnership first. If I tell you that the best colony in town is Sir Wei Tian, the place where you could get the best colony, do you agree with me? How many of you disagree? Okay, what's the best colony in town? Hainan. Oh, actually, it's true. That's true. Yes, true. Yes, okay. No? What's the best colony in town? Sir Wei Tian? <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Who thinks so we can have the best colony in town? Alright. Who thinks uh, uh, there's other places in town that's way better than Sir Okay. What if I tell you the best colony in town is at Sir Wetian? Just assume it is, alright? But I have never tasted and eaten colony. Never. But I go to UH show. The best colony is Sir Wetian. But you never tasted it as well, okay? But I tell you that's the best place. But I've never eaten it. But I've eaten. I've heard people who ate it. It's really good. Would you believe me? Why not? Never tasted it. I wouldn't know. I, I don't even know what kolomi tastes like. I heard Indo Indonesia got good kolomi too. Different kolomi. Different type. So you get what I'm saying? With the gospel, there must be a punishment. That means I must experience the gospel myself. I cannot tell the gospel to someone which I myself do not believe in or I express. It is, it doesn't make sense telling you something good which I don't even believe. The gospel is a partnership between you and the gospel. The gospel of peace. You must apply the gospel in your life, the transformation of the gospel. When you believe, the Holy Spirit does a work of transformation. When the gospel does a deep work, it does a deep work of changing us. When you believe in Jesus Christ, this revelation of who he is, the truth that he's done for us, you know, the victory he's claimed for us, and that changes the way that we live our lives day in and day out. There's evidence of that as well. Because when you see a person who knows Jesus Christ, Christ, the movement of his life, he may not be perfect, he will never be perfect, but you can see the transformation. He was once fearful, becoming more courageous. I still have a hint of it. Who used to swear and curse, but does it less until no more. The gospel transforms life and brings us closer. That's a partnership. But you must be committed to the partnership. Just as the shoe must be strapped on firmly, the partnership with you and the gospel will be complete. It must not be, hey, I believe in the gospel sometimes. It's only convenience, you know. When I come to church, I, I put on my Christian head. That's when the gospel makes sense. But when I leave the church from Monday till, or maybe not even from Sunday to Sunday until the next service, you take off the head out of this building and goes, okay, the, the gospel doesn't make sense anymore. Why? We live in a world, right? Pastor, you know, right? This world is a rocky world. You know, right? Pastor, you know, the world doesn't treat us the same way. You go out there, you must, you must put under the table money sometimes. You know, you know, Pastor, you know, you must lie and cheat. You know, I'm just a bad pastor. I'm just a bad. Just a bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> what I'm saying is this is that sometimes we have the convenience of the gospel in the church. But in this practice of strapping on, there's a full commitment. It stays on at all times. When you go out of this place with the same commitment you came in with the gospel. You don't leave it in the church. You take it with you and be committed 100%. There's a punch. Now, understand this. Let me ask you this question first. How is the gospel applied to you personally today? How is the truth of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, his power, transforming your life today? Are you living in that gospel? Is it applied to you? 
Let's talk about training very briefly. Girls know this more than men, but everybody has gone through this before when they wear their shoes, right? Especially new shoes. When you wear new shoes, especially leather shoes, and you don't wear socks, blisters. Painful blisters. There's a need for you to make sure that the shoe is well suited for you. That it is, doesn't run around, your feet's not too small, or your shoe's not too tight. It must be right, snug. Comfortable. But if there's too much space in that shoe and your feet starts moving, it's going to aggravate and it's going to tear your skin and then you get this. You see, sometimes we put on the gospel and we don't train to fill in that space. The gospel is so much more. Right? So imagine a soldier going to war and his, his first time has never worn the, 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 the uh, his status before. He was, um, it was given to him by his commander. He says, now this is your shoes, all right? This is your straps, uh, uh, your sandals. Oh, by the way, we got war right now. Let's go. He's never worn it before. First time. And then he puts on his sandals. He goes out. We all know that leather needs to be stretched. It needs to be softened. It needs time. So imagine if you go straight out with brand new leather sandals. You're going to get blisters. It's going to hurt. Imagine spreading the gospel without any supervision, without training, without helping. And you go out there, you're going to face a lot of pain and rejection. Which is part of it, right? But what happens is this. Every soldier must be trained. And so when he trains, he doesn't just wear the sandals, he wears the whole armor. And when he puts on the whole armor, he puts on the sandals. And he walks with that every day he steps on. He journeys with it, he walks, and until it becomes soft, and then he's ready to fight in the battle. In Christianity, when it comes to gospel preaching and gospel uh, proclamation, yes, you know, the, the best people to protect the gospel is always the new ones. Because the gospel is so fresh, so new, so ready. But what we want to do responsibly as a church is to train them so that they don't, they don't get burned out or get injured in the process of proclaiming the gospel. We must teach them that the gospel is not just salvation, but the gospel is more than that. A lot of people give up faith because they are ill-trained to bear the gospel. They have not been taught what the gospel truly is. They were told that the gospel is just salvation. But what about gospel that's overcoming sin? What about the gospel of the Holy Spirit that empowers and sets with you soon? What about the gospel that we are all children of God? All that adds on to the traction that we need for the gospel, giving us spikes that we need more spikes as we walk on this terrain. Now be careful to have poorly fitted sandals. Wrong teaching or poor teaching. Be careful that the gospel is not just given to you like a prosperity gospel. Just one-sided form of gospel. Half-baked gospel. Because when you do that, you're going to get blisters in your faith. You're going to be hurt as a Christian. But rather you want to affirm your faith by knowing the gospel and getting trained by it and developed by the gospel day in, day out. Now, how can we be ready? How many of you want to be ready to preach gospel? Someone? Someone, someone just wear like this. Almost ready, Pastor. I don't know that. How can we be ready? From evangelismcoach.org. Guess what? There is an evangelism coach. You can go online. You can check it out. Go online. You can check out all the different tips. And these are two tips. One. Learn to recognize God's guidance. Amen. Learn to know that how God guides. One, by being in the presence, God's presence through prayer. That's when you hear Him and when you learn to be dependent on Him. And in worship, when you learn to adore Him and know that He is magnificent, and where you know His word. You learn to be in His presence first. Because it is in His power, amen. Not in our power, not by our strength, but in His power first. 
So learn to be in his presence first things first. That is part of the strapping on. That is part of the strapping on the gospel is being in the presence of God. Second thing is this, by being in the community of faith, serving the community of faith, and growing in the community of faith. This is important because when you think about the soldier, he has to put on about a 40 pound, 20 kilogram um, armor. He may not be able to lift it all by himself or arrange it. He will need his friends, his fellow soldier. In a Christian faith, we need a community to help on righteousness. We need our community of faith to tell us the truth again and again. We need a community of faith to help us to uh, put on the sandals of the gospel of peace again. We need our community to remind us about the sword of the spirit again. We need to be in a community as often as you can to be strengthened in this to know our gospel to recognize God's guidance not just being in but to serve and to grow together it is necessary it is important there's no lone ranger soldier that is dangerous never set out a young Christian alone even Jesus principle of of sending people into the mission field was two by two. Always two by two. Because you need support. You need encouragement. And you need to learn to serve each other. Amen? So learn to recognize God's guidance through this. The second way, the second tip is learn a version of the gospel. Have and master the gospel script. How many of you know the gospel script? How many of you are trained by the four spiritual laws? By navigators, I believe, right? Navigators train this, four spiritual laws. Another one was uh, the bridge. How many of you know the, the bridge illustration? Yeah? Reverend Jody is an avid user of this. He uses this bridge illustration so well because I've seen it many, many times. The moment someone says to him, I want to know Jesus, he takes a piece of paper and he starts drawing it. He practices a lot. So what happened is this. That is a good training. If you want to be ready, you've got to have bullets, right? You've got to be ready. You've got to be ready when someone asks you, hey, how can I believe in Jesus? I, I don't know. Uh, where I read the Bible. I cannot find the scripture. How can I? Where I call my pastor. Oh, I cannot reach him. He's asleep. Where? Uh, uh, no time. What do you do? Practice. Know one and this one gospel script. Practice. What you can do is find a like minded Christian friend who's also keen to do evangelism and gospel preaching and it's a declaration. Work this script together. This is only one aspect of the script. There are many, many ways that you can preach the gospel, but this is one. But it's good to practice at least one. Okay? At least one. Prepare yourself for this. Last point before I close into application. Stand your ground. The whole point of the armor is to stand your ground against the enemy's scheme. That is the whole point. Stand your ground, but you can't stand your ground without the full armor of God. Of God. The full armor of God involves the gospel of peace, which acts as spikes to your sandals, traction, Helps you to remain grounded. Now, the gospel is robust. You need to grow, continue to grow. In Philippians 1, it tells us to grow in the knowledge of myself. That means you can learn growing, maturing, maturing in the gospel. The gospel is not just salvation, which is what we know first. But if you continue to read the scripture, the gospel is the kingdom of God established on earth through Jesus Christ in every believer. The gospel is about the breaking of racial discrimination and status barriers. The gospel is about transformation of lives and communities. The gospel is the Holy Spirit empowering the church and God dwelling in us and with us. The gospel is Christ breaking the curse and the power of sin. 
There is no longer condemnation to, to those who are in Christ Jesus. The gospel is that there is no longer animosity between God and humanity. We are all reconciled in Christ. And it goes on. The gospel is robust. There's so much we can learn and mature in. So there's a, a challenge that we do is that sometimes we preach only the gospel of salvation. But there's also the, the gospel of peace. There's also the gospel of Christ, the person of Christ. And all this gospel is one gospel, which is Jesus Christ. And we must understand that different ways to express this is robust, and we can grow in it, and we need more of the understanding of the gospel to have more spikes. Why? As you notice, the soldiers in the Roman time will stand shoulder to shoulder across, and people behind them. So imagine you have no spikes on your sandals. And the commander says, advance. And everybody advance, but you cannot because you slipped. What do you think will happen? Imagine. No one's going to stop. I was running a 4x1 relay once, and I was running with my spike shoes on. And as I was running, I told my, my runner in front of me, go up. You know, the technique, go, he sprints and he goes up. But because he stopped, my spike went into his car. I was unable to stop because I was running at a pace that, was that I could not stop him, so I ran over him with my spikes. Was he injured? Of course, he still got a mark today. <laughs> In this scenario, he will, he will be a stampede. The man who stopped and slide will die. Without spikes, without a gospel to keep you grounded, you are going to face a lot of challenges. Slipping and falling. And what we need is to encourage people. You know your gospel. You know the gospel of peace that you have in Christ. Will you put it on? Will you scrap it on? Will you continue to walk in faith? Will you journey in Christ? Staying grounded. It's important. Do not let the enemy deceive you about the gospel. Now, this is where we are. We're on slippery ground. Now, we're close to this point. The devil will use all kinds of tactics to make us slip and fall. Temptations will come left, right, and center. In this context of the gospel of peace, the devil wants to rob us of peace. And so he allows the church, he, he incites within the herds of people gossip. Hurting people hurt other people, right? Instead of forgiving, we gossip. We spread rumors. We, we don't forgive. And so we, instead of stopping it, we incite it. We're like, hey, you know what? I heard that, Pastor Stephen. Go, 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 go. Help, help. Let's spread. Eventually, the whole church gets infected by this deception of the enemy. And the whole church struggles. There's no longer peace in that place. Which is why Paul says, always fight for peace. Earnestly fight to keep peace. By forgiving, by reconciling, by restoring. The devil will use selfishness in the church, self-centeredness in the church. He will use dishonor in the church. To create dissension and discord. Now, when it comes to slippery ground, remember we need to spread on tight. But some of us here have our sandals on. Actually, most of us here have our sandals on, meaning we believe in the gospel. But we need to tie it up. We're, we're, we're still in between gospels the world's promise of good news and Christ's promise of salvation in Him. And we're standing in between. And so we, we're scared that if I commit wholeheartedly into the gospel of Christ, what if this is wrong? Have you heard that? What if Jesus is not God? What if he never went to the cross? What if? And the problem here is that we choose to loosen our buckles, our straps, so that we can slip out of this one, 
so we can go to another one. So that we can have a different conclusions than what Christ is saying. There's few reasons why we will not tie or tighten the good news to our feet. One, no one has taught us and trained us in the gospel adequately. We didn't tell, they didn't tell us that the good news is so good. No matter what, even if you die, die before the gospel, it is still so good. It's worth, that's why Paul chooses to die for the gospel. Why? It is that good. It's worth even risking my life. That's what Paul said. It is worth risking our lives for this good news. So imagine you have a cure for the diseases, every diseases, diseases in the world. Any kind, there's a special cure. And you are the source of that good news. Will you not go out there and say, hey, I got good news. Or will you hear someone say, don't tell me, don't tell me, keep it a secret. Don't tell me. I'll say everybody will rush to you. No, 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 no. If not, you go to prison for this good news. It is unethical, humanly unethical. When you have something good to share that can save people, that can help people, that can restore people from human diseases, right? What more salvation was? It is unethical, humanly unethical, to not share the gospel because it is benefit. It is worth this one. Only by the way to prepare us. The first thing is this, in, in this, that some of us don't step on because we're not taught well, we're not trained well in the gospel. The second thing is this, we're too complacent. We're too relaxed with the gospel. Uh, I know already, but I know already the gospel, I know Jesus died. I know Jesus will come again. I know. I, I, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for 30 years, pastor. It's enough. Don't preach to me, pastor. Oh, by the way, I'm also Christian. I, don't, I just don't go to church, but I'm a Christian. Oh, I don't go to K group, I'm a Christian. Oh, I don't need other Christians because my, my faith is personal. It's between me and God. Only me and God. I don't need anyone else to tell me that I am a believer. I am enough. And so we become complacent. Look, I'm not I'm not throwing this to to harm your faith. I'm saying this to encourage you. Let's not be complacent with the gospel. Not anymore. Let's not take it easy with the gospel. It's just Jesus. You know, one day I was walking by, a young person said to me, it's just Pastor Steve. It's just him. You know, this word, oh, it's just, to anyone, is a dishonoring word. It's just, eh? It's common. It's normal. But if we treat each other this way, then we don't give enough honor to one another. The gospel is not just the gospel. It's not just a gospel. It is Christ. Our complacency causes us to unstrap. It's easier to unstrap. The third is perhaps the one that most people struggle with. The reason why we don't strap on. I want to challenge you to step on after this. The reason we don't step on is because we don't believe. That's it. I heard the gospel, but I don't believe in the gospel. It's not good enough for me. Look, Pastor, you don't know my life. I grew up in a broken family. Pastor, you know what? If God is so good, then why must I go through that? Why must I go through this? Why must they go through that? Why is there suffering this world? God. Is that true? Pastor, come on, it's not true. And so we unbuckle, we unstrap. Why? Because it's easier to let go of Jesus Christ than to continue to have faith and believe. But the gospel is so good. It's so good for you, it's so good for me. And in the gospel, we have life. Joy and suffering, victory over sin. In the gospel, we overcome. We want to invite us. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel, church, 
Will you spread your feet with the gospel? Will you fight the enemy with the gospel? Will you battle with the gospel? The Holy Spirit will help you overcome. Because the gospel is the truth of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, I come, O God, before you. We come before you to ask the Holy Spirit today to bring us, O God, into the time of rediscovering this gospel of peace. That we will be ready to reach out and preach the gospel wherever we go, to declare, proclaim, O God, your good news that is so good that the world must know that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. Father, we pray, O God, for all of us here that your Holy Spirit will soften our hearts to receive your truth today. May your gospel be fastened to us. That we will be fully committed and not partial. Fully committed to your promises, even when we don't understand it yet. Set us off the flame. Thank you. In Jesus' name.